Hi guys, I'm with Grappling Hearts. Today I'm with Sean Applegate. For those who don't know Sean, he's regarded as one of 10th Planet's super good leg walkers. He's competed at events such as like Gracie World, Sapatero, ADCC Trials, that kind of thing. Super happy to have him here. Thanks for coming on, Sean. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. So uh, how are you doing today, buddy? Doing pretty good. Just got up and then did some training this morning and uh, now I'm just kind of hanging out before I go back tonight. That's good. I'm glad you're able to get back. Have Has lockdown been lifted up there yet? I mean, yeah, pretty much in Georgia, we opened up first, I think. So everything's been progressing pretty quickly here. Good. That's great. Um, I guess to kind of get a start us off, I've been asking a lot of people just because I'm really intrigued by everyone's um, roots. So let's kind of talk about what got you into martial arts and got into jiu-jitsu. Okay. Um, I guess... I was like, uh, like a lot of people, like I saw some MMA and uh, I had a friend who was really into MMA and he was like, yeah, man, you should come watch these MMA fights, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. So I went and watched. And I was like, man, those are, those are pretty cool. And that was when Machida was on top. And I was like, wow, uh, you know, I would, I would like to train some martial arts. So Machida seems to be the guy. So I'm going to check out what he does. And, and uh, his thing was he did karate. So I was like, well. I don't know anything about karate. I didn't do it when I was a kid, so I'm going to go check it out. So I found a Shotokan karate place, and it was cool, but it wasn't quite what he was doing, obviously. It was more just regular karate, and um, so that's when I found jiu-jitsu. I visited a karate place that had a jiu-jitsu program, and just so happened to be 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. It was uh, where Brandon McCatherine was at the time, and he talked me into trying it, so I checked it out, and... It was crazy. I thought it was a bunch of tricks. I got submitted a million times. I thought it was a bunch of tricks. I was like, man, I'm going to learn these tricks. I'm going to go back to Gulf Shores where I'm from and go to like, you know, like parties with my friends. I'm going to tap them all out and it's going to be great. And then I found out super quick it wasn't a bunch of tricks. And then I was hooked just like I think everybody else pretty much gets that bug. That's awesome, man. I like how you say it's a bunch of tricks because Synth Planet is quite different than other systems. So it kind of is tricks. (laughs) Yeah. Um. So going from white belt to black belt, where are some of the obstacles you have found getting to that journey? Uh, well, I mean, it just depends on how you try to do it. Like, so some people will just like will just go to the class a couple times a week and then just kind of like let time take its course and go that way. And then they have their own set of struggles. And then you got the guys that want to compete all the time and they have their own set of struggles or like the guys that try to run schools and stuff like that. So I, I kind of, I didn't really have jujitsu in my hometown. So I ended up in this position where I was having to like run a program while also trying to learn at the same time. It's like without an instructor there every day. So the struggle I found like right away was just trying to kind of like lead this program and make sure that, that I was like teaching good stuff, but also still just trying to learn it myself. So I was having to compete and, and just like constantly try to seek out new information and cross train. And it, it was, it was a lot of stuff like that. That's cool. I like how you say you're still trying to go out and learn. Cause a lot of instructors will just sit where they're at and be happy with it. And I was like, Oh no, I'm the best. We're good. Um, so growing, let's say from purple belt to black belt, how do you think leg lock techniques have evolved or changed over the years? Um, in, in my opinion, I think that jujitsu guys never really got their hands on leg locks until the last few years. I think that like, it was a lot of like the early jujitsu guys trying to keep leg locks out of jujitsu, uh, whether it be because, you know, whatever story you believe, whether it be because of ego or just any number of things. Um, I think that martial arts are usually defined by the principles that, that they're governed by. So like, uh, for instance, like wrestling and jujitsu, you have double legs in both. So if I do a double leg at jujitsu class, is it wrestling or jujitsu, you know? Um, I think it actually comes down to like the way you do it. So like jujitsu is efficiency and effectiveness over everything. It's, you know, it, it can be effective, but if it's not efficient, we probably won't do it. It can be efficient, but if it's not very effective, we probably won't do it. Um, so we meet that middle ground. And I think that's the been over the years. If you study like what works at the highest level when everything's allowed, that's been the most consistent. So I think what happened was you had guys doing leg locks and other grappling arts, or maybe they put one thing or the other first, 
But then when jujitsu guys were able to get their hands on it, it exploded because now all of a sudden the jujitsu guys are refining it. They're making it more efficient or they're making other things more effective. So, you know, if, if there's a leg lock that's effective, but it takes like a lot of power and it's not very efficient, the jujitsu guys are going to add the efficiency to it. They're going to find a way to make it easier to do, but still have that power. If you find one that's efficient, but it doesn't really tap a lot of people, it's not super effective. They're going to find a way to like increase that, you know what I mean? And make it to where it's more effective. So I think leg locks have exploded and they're a huge part of jujitsu now. And, uh, I think it's just because jujitsu guys were just shy and never really embraced them until the last few years. Where you say that um, jujitsu guys really love making it efficient, and that's like a big part of it. Do you think that, or let's say within the next five years, do you think they'll still be finding ways to increase that efficiency in leg locks, or do you think eventually it's going to peak? Yeah, well, I don't really. Yeah, I don't think that like with grappling, I don't really think we can ever like truly uh peak because the thing is is like if i do some leg lock technique and no one knows the counter to it then what's going to happen is they're going to find a counter and then my technique's not going to be as efficient anymore because i'm either going to have to power through that counter or i'm going to have to make a new move that makes you know so so the thing is is like if they make a good defense then you come up with a way to efficiently counter that defense and then that goes on forever and that's what we see with other techniques like the clothes guard for instance have been around since the beginning of jujitsu you see new clothes guard stuff all like people are still coming up with new clothes guard stuff they're still coming up with new attacks and new ways to, to do it and the clothes guard is still very much an effective part of the grappling game right now with jujitsu sure. and so half guard clothes guard all that stuff so i think it just keeps growing and, and leg locks are going to be the same way since it's like one entire half the body I just, I can't imagine it maxing out. You know what I mean? I feel you. That makes sense when you put it like that. Um, so where you're known as a leg locker, what are some of the pros and cons you find with that? Uh, the pros are definitely that people who are into leg locks, like are instantly your people. So the people who are into leg locks, like are cool and, and they want to train with you and hang out with you. And you, you, you definitely attract like a certain type. Um, but the cons are that people who aren't really into leg locks are generally like a little like harsh. Like instead of it being like, like if you're into arm bars, nobody really talks trash about your style. They're like, Oh, he really likes to do arm bars. He sucks. No one says that ever, but about leg locks, they're like, Oh, it's kind of like, you're like a substandard, even though like you could submit the same guys or even more guys than some of the other guys can, they'll say that. Another thing that you deal with is like no one wants to go against you in competition ever because it's like this weird thing and they're like, oh, I'm going to get leg locked. Uh, I'm just going to lose or whatever. And like, I don't want to go. And it's like, here's the thing. Leg locks aren't this thing that like that, like you just learn a couple of heel hooks and now all of a sudden, you, you know, you're the, the best in the world. But the guys who don't train them kind of like act like that they're like oh you know if there's heel hooks then it's not even worth me doing so the pros would be there's a huge community of people that are into leg locks and I, I really dig that because those are really cool people in my experience the cons would be it's made it like increasingly difficult when people didn't know who i was or what i like to do in jujitsu i got matches all the time and now it's like pulling teeth trying to get matches with people so yeah that sucks i'm glad you brought that up though i was going to ask too um as far as from then to now, what would you say the evolution of your competition has been like as far as, like you say, getting matches obviously has gotten harder. Um, do you feel like competitions have gotten more um, common and more exciting since you started? Yeah, for sure. I think when I first started out, everything was like IBJJF and uh, like a lot of people really only train the gi and stuff like that. And I think that, like, my coach, Eddie Bravo, like, came out with, like, EBI. And Eddie's a showman. Like, that's his deal. He, sure. he never, Yeah, he never really cared about, uh, like, he, EBI was never supposed to be the toughest jiu-jitsu tournament in the world. EBI was supposed to make it to where people who didn't do jiu-jitsu wanted to watch jiu-jitsu. That's what it was for. It was a show. And so I think as soon as Eddie showed everybody that we can make jiu-jitsu interesting to people and make it a show, it exploded. And now you see all these little invitationals popping up everywhere and the submission like rule set really blew up. And um, so, yeah, I think that, man, I think that there's never been a better time to be involved in jujitsu competition than right now. Like 
you know, when Eddie first started, they were like, all right, well, if it's not IBJJF, then it, it's not real competition. And then they finally accepted ADCC, and now we got submission only. So it's like instead of the IBJJF being 90% of the pie, now they're like 30% of the pie. You know what I mean? And you got sub only and ADCC. So it's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's great. And like you said, Eddie is so good at like coming up with stuff like outside the box and to make stuff relevant. It's like really cool. And like you said, it's really pushed jujitsu further, I believe. Um, so where you're a tenth planet, I feel like a lot, and I mean I could be wrong with this, it might just be everyone in general, but tenth planet, once you hit brown belt, you're generally there for a while. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like it helps you in the long run or do you feel like it's just something that Eddie does just to test people? Um, I think the thing is, is guys can come into our association. Like Eddie's only given out so many black belts. So for right. people to say that they're a 10th planet black belt is still kind of like a special thing right now. Like uh, in the way that I mean that there's not that many of them. So um, I think what Eddie's doing with that and what do we all really do with it is we want to be really careful before we put that stamp on somebody since there's so few of us out here that, you know, we really got to make sure someone's there. I think, like, once you have hundreds of black belts walking around from a team, it's not as important anymore because if some, like, let's say, like, and it happens, let's say some, like, weirdo slips through the cracks and he's out here doing something crazy and they're like, oh, 10th planet black belt does this, does that. If there's only, like, a few of us, then it makes us all look pretty bad. But if there's like a thousand of us, they're like, oh, like if you heard Gracie Baja Black Belt gets caught like doing this thing or that thing, you'd just be like, OK, yeah, because there's like a trillion of those. You know what I mean? So so they don't have to be as careful anymore. So he's doing that. And then also it's just quality control in the beginning. Ed, you know, Eddie still has his hands on everything. So like if you're a 10th Planet instructor or if you're a Black Belt, you have a personal relationship with with Eddie. Like you just there's no way you don't. Our team is super connected. So I think he's also doing that too. He's just got his hands in. He wants to make super sure that you're ready. And uh, so, yeah, I do think it's a good thing. But some of us blow through that. Like Gio was a brown belt for like a couple months or something like that. You know what I mean? And I think Orchard was a brown belt for a very short amount of time. So I think he's just betting everybody, you know? For sure. When you put it like that, um, something I want to add on to that is too, um, I feel like like you said, it makes it more special, but I don't think, like, especially lower belts, they don't realize that once you start giving belts out really early, I feel like it waters down the sport, and, like, like you said, it makes it less special, and it's not so much of that, just it makes it less, um, I don't want to say traditional, because that's not the word I'm looking for, but it for sure ensures the quality of the jiu-jitsu, and like you were going on about the affiliation. And I think like you, like we were saying, I really don't think a lot of lower belts really understand that, especially like when they're just starting out, like, man, why haven't I gotten this belt? Why haven't I gotten that belt? And it's like, well, earn it. Yeah, definitely. Um, That's his thing, you know, so. So um, how long have you had your school now, Sean? Well, I had my school in Gulf Shores for a long time since, like I said before, like I basically had to run a school in order for there to be jujitsu in my, my town. Right. Um, I mean, I didn't start the school initially. It was an MMA school. They just didn't have a jujitsu program. And so the guy was like, hey, you know, you should be the instructor. And I was like, there's no way I'm ready for that. And yada, yada, whatever. So, so you know, that happened. But then after a few years, um, when I was a purple belt, I left that place and I did open my own school. So I had that school for a couple years, maybe, maybe three years or so. And now I'm in Atlanta and I have had 10th Planet Atlanta for about two years now. So, so like, it's a weird answer, but the school I'm in now for about two years. I mean, Hey, it's a weird answer, but it works. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what's next for you? Um, what do you plan on doing for competitions next? And I know this is kind of an odd question because I'm sure a lot of coaches do want to say, yeah, for hundred percent. But, um, do people at your school compete a whole lot? Like, are you trying to develop a very high level student to go out there and represent you? Well, yeah, I mean, because I compete a fair amount, like, and I got uh, the way we train, you know, we train twice a day, every day. So all the students are there for that. 
And like, of course, I don't like push them. They don't have to like do the stuff that we're doing. But I think it inspires like people to want to do it. You know what I mean? Uh, one of the things I do tell my guys is that like, if you join our school, you're either here to become a champion or help someone else become a champion. Because like that right away, uh, they're going to have to roll with the guys that compete. So like myself or a couple of my brown belts that have done well, like in submission only and stuff like that, they, they've got to like train with those guys. And so, you know, like there've been times in class where like I'm getting up and I'm like, all right, guys, listen, here's the deal. I'm rolling today. Uh, I'm getting ready for a tournament. So I'm not mad at any of you guys, but if we roll, I'm going to be moving a little faster. I'm probably going to like go a little harder with you today. And uh, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not mad at you. you. Didn't do anything wrong. You know what I mean? So just, you know, get that straight right away. And then, but I think that in and of itself, they're just like, wow, like, you know, we could go do that too. So, so yeah, I am, I am, you know, I look out for my students. I try to be the best instructor I can. I try to do all that stuff, but I think my students then on their own are just like compelled to do it, you know? And then once a bunch of them do it, even the next generation is going to want it. You know what I mean? So sure. yeah, I guess the answer is yes, but you know. Um, do you plan on doing trials this year? Yeah, yeah, we've already started kind of getting ready for trials. You know, the quarantine threw a wrench in it for everybody. Right. Uh, just just because, like, you know, you you use different facilities. It's not just, like, I go to jiu-jitsu class and, like, that's it. You know what I mean? So it's, like, I need to be able to work out. I need, like, recovery. I need things like that. And so um, I'm going to go up full weight class this year. And so I've been, like, lifting and things like that. And uh, so it definitely threw a wrench in. So I'm already lifting and doing all that stuff. And, uh, but our training hasn't really changed too much yet. So we'll probably wait till about eight weeks out to change the training, but, but yeah, I'm doing it. We're already starting to get ready now. So. Heck yeah. I think it'd be good to see you in there. Um, so one thing I kind of want to ask, I was curious about, you know, Eddie's obviously all the way out in California. Have you ever wanted to move closer to Eddie or do you enjoy being out there kind of away from everyone out of sight? I might outside online kind of thing. Um, I like Eddie a lot and he's, he's a great guy and he's a great coach and all that other stuff. But the thing about it is, I don't, I don't know if I really like California that much. So I've been to California a lot. I can usually spend a few days and then I'm like, it's time for me to go. I got to get back. I mean, I'm from Alabama and like, it's just a different speed. It's a different kind of people out there. You know, anytime for I sure. travel, I've, I've been to a bunch of like the bigger cities and every time I'm there, it's just a few days. And then I'm like, you know, uh i don't know if this is for me you know atlanta is about as big of a city that i can get to without losing that like southern kind of vibe so i think that's it for me i think it's just the people you know and the atmosphere so now nah, i've never really considered moving out there um just because of that i think well and you know it's like you said it's sometimes bigger cities aren't for everyone it's totally understandable um one thing, too, like you mentioned earlier, I think it's cool that Eddie still makes sure he goes to all of the schools to whether it be a seminar or just to check up. Um, I was curious about how often does Eddie come out there? Well, in the beginning, when I first got my affiliation, Eddie came every year. You had to have him out once a year. That was like part oh, okay. of your deal was like, OK, look, you got to have him out for a seminar. He needs to be able to see that everything's how it's supposed to be. And so it was great. I was like, yeah, man, imagine being, you know told that you have to have them out once a year that's great because right. people are like oh does he ever come here and i'm like are you kidding me like i have to bring him but then uh the thing but then our association got so big like now we have over 100 schools so because we have over 100 schools there's just so, so many weekends in a year you know they can't get to all of us right so the thing is now it's like the extra pressure so I, I used to go out there once or twice a year and then he would come once a year now it's become like me having to go out there a little more to see him because, you know, you're on like a list of schools. Like there are new schools that he hasn't been to because they're just so low on that list of seminars that he's trying to chop away at. You know, he has a kid and a family and right. his own life on top of that. Like, man, it's only 52 weeks in a year. Could you imagine trying to get to like 120 schools? That would take years, even if you did it every weekend. So, yeah, there's a list. and. He doesn't come out as much as, you know, some of us would probably like for him to come out. But at the same time, like, I'm super happy for him because the association is bigger than ever and he's got his family and stuff. So so it's for good reasons, you know. For sure. And it's like, I don't think people understand, too, if you got people like 
of course, every black belt has sacrifices they got to make. But when you're in that type of position, the sacrifices are just unreal. Um, so where you go out there every so often, do you see any differences between training or competing out in Alabama versus out in like California or any other bigger city? Yeah, definitely. So I think every region is influenced by whoever like the toughest people in the region are. So, you know, like if you go to like an area and they have like a really good wrestling program in the area, then all the guys that come out of that area are going to be like wrestlers. You know, even the Jiu-Jitsu guys are going to be kind of like wrestlers, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think when I go to California, there are a ton of people that do Jiu-Jitsu and I compete there. Uh, but the thing about going out there and being like really into leg locks is that I think a lot of people out that way are like a little behind the curve on that because they have a lot more of like the gi guys and the, you know, the the IBJJF guys and stuff out there influencing a lot of their games. But whereas on the East Coast, we've had like tons of guys like over the years doing it, you know, like we've got the, the Henzo guys up in New York. We've got the guys down in Florida, um, you know, and there's guys all throughout the East Coast. So I think going out there, the guys are real tough. They got like good guards. They they pass well, you know, stuff like that. They lack a little bit in the leg locks. And I think when you come out here, you get a little more wrestler heavy. And uh, what we do like leg locks and stuff out here too. So um, everyone does it all now, but that is what I experience when I go out there. That's cool to get that perspective. Um, so uh, of course, tenth point, it's mostly a no gi school. Um, do you still train in the gi quite a bit, or is it just one of those things that's like, eh? Uh, well, I never really trained in the gi, right? So I found 10th Planet first. So I never yeah. really trained in, in the gi at all. Um, as a matter of fact, it's funny. The first time I went to a gi school, I was looking for jiu-jitsu, and they had Brazilian jiu-jitsu at this place, and I went to it. And I walked in, and my only experience with jiu-jitsu had been 10th Planet. And I saw them all in the gis, and I had done karate. So I thought jiu-jitsu was like karate, where there's all these different types of it, you know, and some are real and some aren't, you know, and so I walked in, right. and so I'm grabbing the clothes, and I was like, yo, this isn't what I was looking for, this is, this is like some fake shit or something, you know what I mean, I was like, this isn't, this isn't it, you know what I mean, but I turned <laughs> jiu -jitsu. Out it was, was jiu-jitsu, I just didn't know what I was looking at, because I was a new white belt, but, uh, but yeah, no, I don't really train the gi at all, uh, I put the gi on a little bit for judo, I was trying to learn uh, some judo, I still am trying to learn some judo, um, and I think, at some point, I will get a black belt in the gi just to kind of have both and be able to say I did it because it is jujitsu and and I want to know more about jujitsu. I do love jujitsu, so I don't ever train the gi now, but maybe in the future. Um. So where you brought up wrestling and judo, do you feel like it's important to be um, diverse in your uh, learning experiences to try to implement all the as much as you can for um, your competition game? As far as the uh, arts. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of rule sets where if you can't grapple on your feet, then you're going to get lost. Like I think ADCC, if you can't wrestle or do judo, then you're kind of screwed because the rules are going to put you on your feet in some circumstances where you can't sit. Right. Um, I think that in self-defense, you have to know how to deal with people approaching you on your feet. You know, like you can't only have guard pulls and like sacrifice throws and stuff like that where you go to your back right away like can be dangerous in self-defense scenarios um i don't know about if i buy into the whole complete grappler thing where they say like oh you have to be able to do this you have to do that because i think that there are technical answers for everything like for you sure. know like i don't have to learn how to sprawl i could learn a bunch of sacrifice throws to counter double legs you know what i mean like i don't have to learn but yeah to answer i guess in short yeah i think you do have to learn that stuff because really modern jiu-jitsu has a foundation built in judo you know sport jiu-jitsu especially and so when you start learning judo you learn so much about jiu-jitsu that you didn't know was there there's so much under the surface that jiu-jitsu guys don't talk about like just simple things like kazushi like off balancing it's like day one judo they tell you what kazushi is but then you yeah. go to jiu-jitsu they don't say anything about kazushi and you're like okay well wouldn't this work better if i could get the guy off balance and they're like oh yeah sure man just put it do this do that you know the jiu-jitsu guys are like oh yeah whatever but in judo they're like yes and here's exactly how you do it so i think so yeah it's funny you mentioned that i had never even heard the term kazushi or been taught like off balancing until i went to you know uh, we're with gracie now went there and josh hayden he was really big on saying kazushi and it was funny because me and a couple other girls were like 
is he saying skadoosh? Is this like Kung Fu Panda? Like we were so confused. <laughs> um, so, um, Sean, what do you think so far has been your uh, biggest accomplishment? Um, probably, and it, it doesn't seem like it, but probably uh, winning Gracie World. Uh, because Gracie Worlds was this special thing that I feel like the jiu-jitsu community wasn't ready for when it came out. It was essentially like submission, this is the submission only world championships, you know what I mean? And uh, like tons of big name guys competed in it, but they just didn't have the media back then to push it like they do now. Like if, if there was Gracie Worlds now, flow grappling would be like all over it. You 100%, I mean? yeah. The rule set for Gracie Worlds was so crazy. Like, like, Again, you never hear anyone talk about it, but if you won a gold medal at Gracie Worlds, you submitted every opponent they put in front of you. There's no way to win Gracie Worlds without submitting every opponent they put in front of you. If you're in an elimination match, like so not the finals, and you don't submit your opponent, you're both disqualified, and all of the final matches were no time limit. Like I saw DJ Jackson and Oliver, or, or uh, what's Orlando Sanchez go for 45 minutes one time. I mean, it wasn't a great match but it was 45 minutes you know that's still hard yeah yeah and like um like the names the kind of people they competed there are crazy names like barry yoshida was there here and gracie competed there kurt osiander competed there keenan cornelius competed i mean the names just go on and on and on so it was basically like in the day before again before the big media push in jiu-jitsu it was essentially like hey like can you go here and submit all these world-class people? Okay, if you can tap them all, then you can get a gold medal. But if you can't tap them, then we'll see you. You know what I mean? And so to me, winning Gracie Worlds was probably the most meaningful to me. Also because it was like something of a world championship. Like I, I wouldn't call myself a world champion, but it was like something of a world championship. And uh, like I had this whole thing with my grandma. When my grandma died or whatever, she told me that I needed to be like a world champion. And so to me, it was like, all right, cool. Like I did that for, for my grandma too. You know what I mean? So I felt good about that. Oh, that's really sweet. Yeah, I definitely think it's a really good accomplishment. Like you said, um, if we had the technology back then that we do now, for sure it would have been a lot more hype. Um. I guess before we head off here, I just want to give a shout out to um, our sponsors, um, you know, uh, Sweeps Apparel, Stretch Nine, BTG Coffee. Um, Sean, do you have anyone you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, uh, my sponsors, uh, Veil Solutions, Phalanx, Datsutsara, Savage Soap. Um, I don't think I'm leaving anybody out. Yeah, that's about it. Cool. All right. One more thing before we sign off here, Sean. This is kind of for, you know, my husband, Joe. He wanted me to extend this offer to you. Um, of course, you don't have to answer right now. It's totally on table. Um, we could talk details later. Um, Joe and his friend Jason Mather, we actually run this tournament down in Tennessee at Jason's school. It's called Bigfoot Grappling. Um, Joe was wanting to know if you'd ever be interested in coming out competing. And Joe said they could also set you up to have a seminar the day before or sometime around there. Um, that's something you're interested in. Feel free to hit us up later okay yeah sure anytime i think i talked to jason before so um yeah as long as the matches like make sense as long as there's something like you know that can be arranged that i'm definitely in that sounds great awesome cool um thanks for coming on here sean yeah thanks for having me i had a great time i'm glad you did thank you thank you bye bye